Hello everybody, I'm George from Ireland and here I am in India. Well, I say India, almost India, India's next colony. I'm in the United Kingdom and this is the Royal Pavilion at, Bight at Brighton. So this um, town on the, the, the southern coast of, of England um, and uh, this um, uh, bizarre um, piece of architecture, considering the country, was built here in um, uh, 1787. Well, that's when construction commenced, but it wasn't finished for 24 years. This is the work of John Nash, uh, though he also built an extension to it after that. So it's Indo-Saracenic style. I mean, Saracens that we used to call like um, Middle Eastern Muslims. You see the domes as you find of a mosque, other minaret-like features. I don't know anything about architecture, I'm sure that shows. And it's quite individual. But down at the base of these columns, like lotus flowers, that's a Hindu symbol. Um, anyway, so um, the Duke of Cumberland used to come here. He was the, the younger brother of King George III, who was known for his fast living. And then, he, then the Duke of Cumberland's nephew, uh, George IV started coming here. George IV, who was Prince of Wales at the time, subsequently Prince Regent. So well, let's just call him George IV. Um, and he first came at the age of 21, and then it was four years later when he commissioned this to be built. Um, so he really was a big spender. He liked to indulge himself. He had Carlton House built, which is down the, down the um, Mall from uh, Buckingham Palace. So spending on parties, on clothes, he liked the gaming tables and so on. And all that was going on, on here because the Duke of Cumberland was into that sort of thing, fine, fine dining um, uh, and getting stocious of an evening, mistresses and so on. So. Um, that uh, George IV, he, he married um, someone he absolutely hated, a German princess, but uh, he was really smitten by Mrs. Fitzherbert, this twice widowed Catholic who was childless from both her marriages. And uh, um, anti-Catholicism was a fact of life in Great Britain at the time. So uh, pursuant to the Royal Marriages Act, no member of the royal family could marry without the king's say so. And uh, he was never gonna get permission to marry her. Moreover, had he married her, he would have been disbarred from the line of succession. And so would his spouse, because the Act of Settlement said that um, no Roman Catholic could ever, ever, ever recede to the throne, nor indeed anyone married to a, a, a papist. Um, there is a rumour that he married uh, Mrs Fitzherbert in secret, but perhaps that was a nullity. And he subsequently married Caroline of Ansbach, if I got that right. I always forget my Carolines. Uh, there, there are a few of these uh, Germanic uh, well-born women who married into uh, the House of Hanover. I know the Hanoverians were quite German themselves, well, themselves especially in the beginning. Um, anyway, so uh, what else about this uh, Brighton Pavilion? So um, then it was designed by artists inside and the interior design is a much more Chinese style. And of the Indian styles they could have gone for, why did they go for the more Islamic one? Well, remember the Mughal dynasty was still extant, was still ruling until 1858. And uh, the East India Company, which was, which was still uh, going concerned until 1858, were strictly speaking in vassalage to the Mughal Empire. So as Mohammedans um, ruled uh, North India, certainly, um, that's why that, that was much more influential. Um, um, anyway, the, the British Raj wasn't as interested in South India. Um, anything south of Mumbai, all right, there was Madras Presidency. Madras would now call it uh, Chennai. But most of the wealth was in the north, including Bengal, as in half of which is now Bangladesh. And then you can see HRH, His Royal Highness George PW, does it say PW? And then the year 1824, if I got that right. Um, anyway, so a lot of these look like chimneys, but I'm not sure they actually had fireplaces there. Perhaps they did, there was a chimney tax. So this was showing off. But then again, being royalty, they may well have been exempted from the chimney tax. So it's called Pavilion um, Parade around here, the street which looks onto it. And one of the constituencies is called Brighton P Pavilion because Brighton's so big, it's got two constituencies. A constituency has roughly 70,000 people, but Brighton's so big, it's got uh, two. And then I think a bit of the city's given over to a, a neighboring constituency. That's a bit of P Brighton Pavilion Street. Um, so, uh, but anyway, then William IV used to come here. That's the Sailor King. Um, and then Queen Victoria, she acceded to the throne um, in um, uh, 1837 at the age of 18 years. So she disliked Brighton. It was associated with the dissipation of her uncle. Um, and uh, she was too widely recognized by people in the street who were decidedly forward. And that was not to her taste. Um, is her great uncle, the Duke of Cumberland, had been here and, and renting a relatively modest farmhouse very close to here. At, called at Stein, but it no longer stands. 
Um, anyway, uh, what, what else was I going to say? So she, she wasn't interested and eventually was sold to the city of Brighton, but, that, but without most of the furniture. A lot of the furniture was removed to London to Buckingham Palace and various other royal residences. So um, Brighton City Council, or corporation we would have called it back then, struggled to find a use for it. Uh, um, but then, then in the, the First World War, a lot of Indian soldiers were cared for here. Perhaps seeing this familiar architecture was thought to be conducive to a rapid recovery. Those who'd been wounded in the First World War or fallen ill were shipped across from France, which of course is not very far away. And so the music room, the banqueting hall and various large rooms were, were, were converted into uh, what, what we call them wards for the patients that could be operated on here. Now, a number of them died and Hindus and Sikhs as per the usages of their faith, were cremated in, at a gut, a sort of cremation, what would you call it, platform, not very far away in land, which, which is still there, still stands, not that it's used for its original purpose, but kept uh, there in honour of them, and ceremonies take place there to, to honour the dear departed. Okay, so this is another elevation, sort of the north elevation of it. And what are those little bauble things on the roof for? But I was surprised that the, the, the grass is actually not very well kept. You think it'd be a lawn, but then again, they, people wanted to support themselves on it. And behold, yonder statue, that uh, bluish green, well, maybe turquoise statue, metal statue of George IV uh, in a sort of ancient Roman style, betogered and wearing this laurel wreath, hail to you and Victor's laurels and whatnot. Um, Anyway, in the 20th century, to try and make a go of this place, um, uh, various members of the royal family, like George V, just after the First World War, he lent them some of the furniture which had originally um, been furnishing this very extensive house. Um, and the Maharaja Patiala, one of the, the Sikh grandees of India, came around after the First World War, and he, op he, he opened this new gate here, and that is to honour the Indian soldiers who passed away here because some of them, so stricken by their wounds, fighting on the Western Front, could not be saved by the doctors. Um, so uh, that, that's, that's, in, that's in memory of them. Then there were some stables because, of course, until the 20th century and uh, motor cars being widespread, any large organisation needed to have a lot of horses for people to get around, to transport goods and so on. And so the stables were here. Not such an ugly building either. Also in an Indian style. Um, so, uh, and it's, it's since been converted to an art gallery. This I have been into. I've never been into the... Um, uh, the Brighton P Pavilion and it's some um, uh, sort of Chinese interior. Do they not know what they're doing? Were they getting a bit confused saying these Asiatics, they're all the same? I mean, remember that the East Indies meant what well, now called India, but also Pakistan, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, not quite China. That was the, um, the Unreal East India Company first uh, took Hong Kong in the first Opium War because it was uh, trading so much with Cathay but uh, decidedly miffed when the Emperor of China said he didn't want uh, the British selling hard drugs to his subjects. And uh, the UK took the gravest possible umbrage of this outrageous intrusion upon their right to do commerce. Um, okay, so that's probably enough from the uh, Royal Pavilion at Brighton. I do want to go in one day, but uh, it's, it's a little bit shabby at the rear. You think it could do with a lick of paint, which ought to be repaired a bit more. And so here are these public gardens, but. Uh, People get up to all sorts of naughtiness here. We have a lot of complaints about antisocial behavior, about lewdness, about the abuse of drugs and so forth. Um, so yeah, uh, that's it. Go in, walk around as a museum, close at five o'clock, opens most mornings at 10 in the morning. Uh, so please follow me on Twitter and Instagram, on Facebook, and uh, donate to me with the greatest possible liberality on, on um, uh, PayPal. I'm georgecallahan79 at gmail.com. So reporting to you from the Royal Pavilion at Brighton, many people consider it a folly, but uh, I consider it almost a gem. It's a fascinating historical phenomenon. You should find this plonked in, in the middle of a very British city. And some of our Commonwealth cousins, no doubt British citizens are here. Well, you see how things change, how we're a globalized world. Okay, so that's enough from me. I'll switch it off now. Toodaloo.